Hi, everyone. This is Jason Barak of Wall Street for Mean Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Mean Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first time guest. He is Peter Bookvar. He is the chief market analyst with the Lindsay Group, a macroeconomic and market research firm. He is co CIO at Bookmark Advisors and a regular CNBC contributor. And he is editor of the Book Report, which is his newsletter. Peter, thank you for joining me. Thanks, Jason. Now, Peter, uh, I want to ask you about Donald Trump, President Trump. Uh, it seems to me he wants a weak dollar. Do you think he wants a weak dollar? Well, there's actually conflicting messages on that. He wants a weak dollar in the sense that he wants to bring U.S. manufacturing back to the U.S. and make it more competitive to export to overseas uh, countries, and a weak dollar would help that. On the other hand, there's this thing called the border adjustment tax, which is a key component of the Ryan tax plan, which we're hearing that the Trump administration is behind. Well, in order to make that work, where it would tax imports and not tax exports, the, mo- the model needs the dollar to rally the 20% equivalent that the import tax would be of 20%. So do they want a strong dollar if they're going to be supportive of the Ryan tax plan? Or do they not want a strong dollar and therefore not be? So I have to say they're for U.S. manufacturing and they're for exports. But whether that entails a strong dollar or weak dollar, it's very not clear. Those are excellent points. You know, you you brought up how there's kind of conflicting things in Trump's uh, economic and jobs policies. You know, it seems that when you add up all these things together, I don't know how they're going to make mathematical sense. He's talking about tax cuts and reducing rules and regulations, which I think is good for small small and medium sized businesses. It's good for the real economy, and that here he is talking about potentially you know tariffs, protectionism, and that could you know create cost push inflation and bring a lot of higher costs into the value value chain into the supply chain because, um, you know, so many companies in the U.S. bring in raw materials. So I don't see how that's going to uh, create uh, lower costs when he wants to do that. I, I agree. Um, there are certainly a lot of conflicts. I mean, we're not going to know, um, on at least on the trade side, what his stance is until we hear whether they're behind the border adjustment tax or not. Ryan is very much behind it. It's in his plan. And the thing about the border adjustment tax is they don't need to go on these trade battles with individual countries if they implement that. But on the other hand, if they implement that, that has its own potentially negative repercussions for any company that imports products from overseas. It has major implications for overseas economies that exports to the U.S. So the end result may be very similar. It's just the path to that end game uh, could be uh, different uh, different complexions. Yeah, I could see this making a mess of things and creating a very large headache for small and medium-sized businesses. Obviously, large corporations can deal with this better. They can hire lawyers and they can hedge their currency exposure and they can pay lobbyists. But uh, I think this is going to lead, if Trump gets his way on a lot of these things, this is going to lead to potentially worse stagflation down the line in the U.S. I, I, I don't disagree. I, I think the initial reaction on a border adjustment tax or any other type of tariff would be uh, immediately felt through higher inflation. And if the dollar is going to rally, uh, well, maybe it takes multiple years for that to happen. So uh, you very well could have this window of higher inflation, stagflation, as you say, uh, that can actually lead to um, higher interest rates and a recession uh, until the benefits of tax reform are felt um, many years down the road. Yeah, and it seems that the uh, politicians, whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats, are kind of delaying things with Trump's taxes right now, which is unfortunate. But, you know, there's so many political games going on. There's people accusing, you know, Donald. There's a lot of Democrats, unfortunately, who still believe Donald Trump is a Russian spy, despite the fact that there's no evidence that he is. Yeah, I wouldn't think that he is. Um, I I think there's uh, a lot of pushback within Republicans on the tax reform because this border adjustment tax is so controversial. And you have 52 Republican senators. Well, we know two of them are not going to vote for it. They're the senators of Arkansas because they are supportive of Walmart. And Walmart's not only the biggest employer of the country, they obviously import a massive amount of goods from overseas. You also have other senators, Republican senators, are not behind this too. The problem is, is that there doesn't seem to be a plan B to the Ryan tax plan because this border adjustment tax is modeled 
to pay for, over 10 years, half of the cut in the corporate tax rate and the immediate expensing of, of capital spending. So if the border adjustment tax is not part of this, well, then they're not going to be able to make this uh, deficit neutral or revenue neutral, and they're going to have to find another way of reforming the tax code. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a plan B right now. So it could be the Republican Party themselves that cause an issue for Trump because they're not on board with this tax, for even forgetting about any support or none from uh, the Democrats. Yeah, I, I just don't see how this math works uh, with all the spending projects that Trump has in mind. Uh, you know, he could talk about a strong dollar, but, you know, in actuality, I think he wants a weak dollar. And I think, you know, he wants a dovish Fed. I think he wants the ability to go out there and spend the money for increasing military. He wants the money to go out there and for his infrastructure projects and to potentially build a wall. And, uh, you know, th that's just a lot more spending projects that the U.S. can't really afford right now. Uh, maybe in the long term, if the economy were to improve somewhat, uh, it would be easier to be able to afford it. But I, I just don't see the math working right now without, you know, the Federal Reserve helping him out. Well, a couple of things to that. On the spending side, they want to cut discretionary spending by the same amount that they want to increase defense spending. The infrastructure discussion, that can take many different parts. The how, uh, Congress and, and we signed into law last year a big infrastructure project, so I, I don't expect much on that end. With respect to the Fed, it was candidate Trump that said we're in a big, big fat, ugly bubble driven by the Fed. And it's President Trump that's tweeting about how great it is to have a high stock market. <laughs> yeah. So, so there, there's, on one hand, he acknowledges the bubbles that the Fed has created. Uh, on the other hand, he needs it to facilitate his program. Uh, but unfortunately, Yellen is not going to be making visits to the Oval Office and telling Donald what he what she's going to be doing. Uh, it's apparent what she's going to be doing. Uh, she's speaking right now, and they are intent on raising rates in a few weeks and likely raising rates uh, three times, and we'll see how things go maybe four times this year. Now, Donald Trump has three empty voting seats on the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, or FOMC. Do you think then he could sabotage these rate increases by doing that, or is it too long of a process for him to get uh, maybe free market people in there, or Austrian school economists, or do you think he won't even appoint those types then to the Federal Reserve uh, Board of Governors? No, I think he will make those appointments, but here's another potential contradiction. We've had the biggest um, uh, makeup of doves in the history of the Fed over the past eight years. So I don't think Donald Trump is going to uh, appoint more doves. Well, then, by definition, if you're going to appoint more hawkish members, well, then they're going to lead to leaning towards more rate increases, which then can obviously disrupt what uh, Trump is trying to do. So I think that <laughs> that's a difficult spot for him, too. I mean, Trump, putting aside what you think about him, he's in a very unlucky position because he's coming in in the eighth year of an economic expansion, the eighth year of a stock market, bull market, that is as expensive or almost as expensive as 1929 in the year 2000, depending on what metrics you look at, as opposed to Obama when he became president. He got very lucky that two months after he became president, the stock market already down 55% bottomed because the Fed started printing money. Just as Ronald Reagan got lucky as he came in, after, you know, in the middle of a recession and a 16-year bear market that was just ending and interest rates were about to collapse. George Bush got unlucky because he came in just as the tech bubble was unwinding and had to live through 9-11 uh, and a recession. So a lot of the success for Trump or failure is the circumstances that he takes office. And at least those macro circumstances, he's very unlucky. Yeah, I agree. He inherited an enormous mess from Obama. The debt tripled under Obama, and there's a lot. There's still there's so much corruption in D.C. with the government agencies uh, that the Obama administration did. Not that there wasn't corruption before, but it seems I live right outside of Washington D.C. for the last uh, 16 years, and it seems to have accelerated under the eight years of the Obama administration. I, I, I don't disagree. <laughs> well, well, Peter, are you aware that Danielle DiMartino Booth actually nominated you for one of those seats? She says you should get one of those seats on the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Danielle is a good friend, and uh, I, I appreciate the shout-out. But um, 
I, I don't think uh, someone like me would be allowed anywhere near the Eccles building. Yeah, I, I'm reading her book right now. I'm almost done with it. It seems, you know, just such a bureaucratic process. And I didn't see that you have a PhD in Keynesian economics. And, you know, they're very strict about that. <laughs> yes, that's why I would not be allowed anywhere close. But I, I value, you know, real market ex experience instead. Now, the stock market has had 12 consecutive positive days. I think the last time this happened was 1987. You mentioned stock market valuations. If we subtract the share buybacks, and there's been well over a trillion dollars in share buybacks by uh, the large cap companies since uh, 2009, uh, what do you think the valuation of the stock market would be? Would it, would it be near all-time highs? Uh, that's actually a great question. Um, yeah, we've seen a lot of shrinkage of uh, the amount of stock available through these stock buybacks. And uh, by shrinking that base, it, it gooses earnings per share. So obviously the stock market by definition would be much more expensive as earnings would be less without that influence of uh, stock buybacks. So you can easily call the pace of earnings improvements since the 09 low being of low quality because not only was it stock buybacks, it was a dramatic reduction in interest expense, which goosed earnings. It was lower effective tax rates, which goosed earnings. It was uh, a modest pace of capital spending, which meant that depreciation expense was reduced. And there was the lowest share of profits going to labor since World War II where the revenue side was very mediocre. So yes, the earnings recovery since the recession was very low quality, and certainly stock buybacks was, was a major culprit of that, which gets to if we're now in a rising interest rate environment, companies are going to have uh, less room to continue to increase debt, where corporate debt levels have never been this high before, both in an absolute basis and relative to cash flow. Uh, that's going to be one lever they're not going to be able to pull lower interest expense, a lever they can't pull. Labor is getting a greater share of profits now, so margins are getting squeezed there. So we can actually have a better economy in a, in a, in a way that isn't necessarily helpful to corporate earnings and corporate profit margins because of the reversal of the benefits we've seen over the past eight years. That's that's very interesting. Yeah, it, it seems like there's been perverse incentive structure for a lot of these large cap corporations. You know, they do the share buybacks, uh, and, you know, it's not smart long term, I think, for creating new products and services or or higher employee salaries at the lower levels. But, you know, the executives, if they beat earnings, they play the earnings beat game with the stock analysts. And yet they beat every single quarter. And in two or three years, they've you know triggered their stock options packages. I think, you know, that's setting it up where a lot of these companies four or five years from now, they have real bad balance sheet problems. We're kind of seeing this with the larger cap oil stocks first, uh, because I think I just saw this article a couple days ago on the oilprice.com, and it said, despite the oil price you know, falling so much since 2011, all the large cap oil companies, their costs have gone up 66% uh, over since 2011, despite the oil price falling. So it's been head scratching and the companies, you know, a lot of them have done share buybacks instead of focusing on operations and making them more efficient. Yeah, I mean, Exxon was the poster boy for stock buybacks. So uh, they bought stock at much higher levels than, than the stock is today and they've levered up their balance sheet. And uh, But, you know, th these are not growth companies. So the way for them to goose their earnings was through these stock buybacks. Uh, there's no question. I want to transition now and ask you about currency exchange rates. You know, we're, I think we're seeing really unprecedented from historical times uh, moves in the currency markets. Is, is that what you're also seeing, record amounts of volatility in currency exchange rates? No, no question. Uh, but that is just a byproduct of the extraordinary extent that central banks have gone in order to manipulate uh, interest rates and therefore um, currencies. So you have the ECB printing 80 billion euros a month. That's actually being trimmed to 60 as of April. Bank of Japan obviously doing what they're doing where their balance sheet is 90% of GDP. And you know, even the Fed that uh, quintupled their balance sheet and uh, also had interest rates at zero for as long as it did. So when you have these kind of uh, actions, also in the Bank of England, of course. You have every country that doesn't want a strong currency. You have Switzerland and Sweden and Denmark 
going to negative interest rates along with the ECB. I mean, these are unprecedented times. I mean, never in, in at least over the last 5,000 years, I've seen some studies, have we had negative interest rates. And that's going to have uh, a dramatic influence on the direction of foreign exchange. And, you know, it gets to the point where countries should not be rooting for a weak currency. We should have stable currencies. That's what drives economic growth, is stable currencies, not uh, artificially suppressed um, currencies. Because on the other hand, uh, it, it destroys the cost of or, or the standard of living of your people. Yeah, and it seems that there's competitive devaluations with these guys. You know, they're all they're they've all basically learned from the same handful of schools with their PhD in Keynesian economics, and then you know it's mercantilism. So they're all trying to get a weaker currency to uh, boost their exports. But if everyone's trying to export it, it it you can't do it. <laughs> right, exactly. It, it's a, it's a zero sum game, of course. Well, uh, if the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates uh, a couple times this year, like you said, and everyone else is not, that seems to me then we're setting up then for a, a much stronger dollar relative to the other currencies going forward, which could cause a lot of problems for uh, a lot of foreign corporations that have borrowed too much dollar-denominated debt and a lot of foreign governments that have borrowed record amounts of dollar-denominated debt as well. Well, yeah, in, in theory, interest rate differentials certainly move currencies, but we have to put the rate increases from the Fed in the perspective of where inflation has gone. Uh, inflation is still rising at a faster pace than they are raising interest rates, and maybe they do catch up this year. But at some point, there's going to be economic implications to these rate increases. So even though they want to raise three times this year, uh, all you need is the stock market to decline, <laughs> and the Fed will be afraid to continue to raise interest rates. So I think people have to look at it that. And let's talk about, like, let's just say the euro against the dollar. Yeah, rise in interest rates theoretically would be good for the dollar. But on the other hand, beginning April 1st, as I mentioned, the ECB is cutting QE by 25%. So that's going to be somewhat of an offset. We've seen a rise in commodity prices of, uh, over the past year. Well, that's been a boost to um, the new commodity currencies, such as the Australian dollar, the Brazilian real. So it's, it's, it's not as simple as, oh, the Fed's raising rates by the dollar. You know, the dollar index is really no diff, no, is where it was two years ago, and we're about to get our third rate hike. So I, I think it, it goes deeper than just, okay, the Fed's raising rates and no one else is by the dollar. Yeah, I think I think that a lot of hedge funds have crowded into that long dollar trade, and I expect to see a lot more volatility up and down going forward in the dollar index. I expect uh, a lot more volatility in general in asset prices too, as well going forward. Agreed. Uh, I want to ask you now about this dollar shortage. So I watch Real Vision TV. I know Raul Paul. Uh, Raul Paul and Grant Williams and other hedge fund managers are talking about this, but you know I also see record amounts of debt from foreign corporations who borrowed in dollars, from foreign governments who borrowed in dollars. It seems very perverse to me that these guys, you know, with their actions are use, borrowing record amounts of U.S. dollar denominated debt, and yet they're talking about a dollar shortage. What's, what's your opinion about this? Right. There's about $10 trillion of, foreign, uh, of dollar denominated foreign debt. So, yeah, I, 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 I've listened to them and, and uh, I respect their opinions and um, I, I struggle with uh, the, the back and forth of whether that is the case or not, and 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 and, and I get their argument. Uh, I just I really haven't been able to form a very strong opinion on whether that is going to be such a big factor in in, in driving the dollar. Um, I, I think a lot of the direction of the dollar also gets back to Trump again with this border adjustment tax, because you're going to see a 20 percent increase in the cost of goods sold in the U.S. and companies are going to want to offset that through higher prices, which if the Fed's going to be slow in raising interest rates, that's going to be potentially very dollar negative. So I, I, I go back and forth in this dollar shortage thing. Whenever I hear about something like of a shortage of the reserve currency of the world, um, I, I think that's um, taking it a bit too far, but these are smart guys, so I, I, I have to respect their opinions. Yeah, to use an analogy, it seems kind of like, you know, the drug addict who's done a lot of drugs and has run out of supply temporarily, and they're saying, oh, there's a shortage. So that's how I view, you know, the global economy that, you know, they've gotten addicted to all these cheap dollars, uh, U.S. dollars and debt and treasuries that they can borrow for cheaply and use as collateral. And yet, you know, when they run out of them because they've made stupid bets or made bad investments, then they say, oh, there's a shortage now. That's the way I view things. Right. No, ag agreed. Um... 
Agreed. And, you know, a lot of these companies, a lot of these foreign companies and countries that, that took on the dollar-denominated debt, you know, a lot of them do business in the U.S. So it's, so they, they, it's, I don't find anything wrong with taking on uh, dollar-denominated debt if you're a foreign company, if you're doing business in the U.S., because you can pay those bonds off with the dollars you accumulate in the U.S., just as U.S. companies take on foreign-denominated debt in other parts of the world, particularly in Europe and Asia. So I, I don't quit, I don't have a problem with a large amount of dollar-denominated foreign debt if these companies uh, are doing business in the U.S. I want to transition now to gold and your opinion on gold. Do you think the dollar, the U.S. dollar, and the dollar index in gold can can rise together going forward as more uncertainty comes, more volatility comes in currency exchange rates, and also asset prices? Either a stock market crash, like you said, uh, where potentially a 35-year-plus bond bull market is ending now. So, do you think that's going to benefit the dollar index and also gold potentially rising together? Yeah, I, I think gold uh, ended its bear market in December 2015, and I know it goes through fits and starts here with what the Fed is going to do, but I, I think people should still understand that this is an extraordinarily dovish Fed, and even whoever replaces Young will probably be very dovish, and that the Fed is so far, I, I, I wrote a note today, that the Fed is so far behind the curve that no member of the FOMC would be able to make my son's Little League team. <laughs> and that means that that's why I don't subscribe to the strong dollar case on Fed rate hikes, because they are going to be very slow in normalizing policy. And therefore, I think gold uh, is going to be a large beneficiary of that. And we have seen over the past month a uh, situation where gold has rallied uh, at the, uh, on days that the dollar has as well, and I think that is a, a very uh, big possibility in the next couple of years as dollar rallies against all fiat currencies. Do you think the other commodities could potentially have a rally as well, or do you think it's going to be mostly the precious metals? Because when I look at the data for a lot of the global economy, I see the global economy, the real economy is slowing down, uh, and that I, I don't see you know bullish growth in a lot of other countries. The, well, let, let's let's break down the different commodities. Um, I started to get bullish more than a year ago on the industrial metals, not because I saw any uptick in the, on the demand side, but I saw finally, due to the collapse in prices, a response on the supply side. So you had capacity cuts uh, for many different companies, and also you had China. Uh, deciding that, you know what, we have too much ex excess capacity in a variety of commodities and we're going to cut back. And that's what created the bottom in commodities. It's not that the bad news got good, it's just the bad news got less bad because of the supply cuts. Then you have energy. We obviously have seen a dramatic decline in, in supply cuts around the world, particularly in major uh, offshore projects where, you know, a trillion dollars plus of capital spending was, was put to sleep. Uh, certainly we've seen a recent uptick in the rig count, but that's how commodities make bottoms is when the supply side responds. Uh, agriculture is obviously a little different because, you know, corn and soybeans are still going to be grown, so that's more of a, um, a, a weather thing. But at least on the energy and industrial metal side, um, I, I look at more from a supply-demand storm point rather than uh, necessarily a play on the dollar. Very good. Yeah, I think, you know, the, there was a lot of miners, whether they're base metals or oil producers or gold and silver miners, that had the commodity prices from 2013 to 2015 during the heights of the bear market. Had they kept going lower, there was going to be an enormous amount of bankruptcies, and that was going to really distort the supply side. So I didn't think it was it was guaranteed that a lot of the commodity prices we can, was going to keep going lower because we were just going to see a lot of companies go bankrupt and in problems on the supply side, like you said. Right, right, yes. I agree. Oh, well, uh, are, are there any particular industries or sectors, in your opinion, that you think uh, the next couple of years will either be in a bear market, uh, a bear market for potential shorting opportunities, maybe consumer discretionary, or in a bull market on the long side that maybe will benefit extra from President Trump or what you see in the global economy? Well, the, the consumer discretionary side right now is dealing with the possibility of this border adjustment tax. 
and the, the, the high cost of imports. So if you're a company like Best Buy, for example, that imports, let's just say, 90% of their, their products, well, then they should be very worried about this. So that is going to have an impact there. Uh, then you have exporters that, that have a lot of production in the U.S., like Ford, for example, more so than the other auto companies, that have a lot of U.S. manufacturing. Uh, they're going to be a beneficiary of, of Trump tax reform. You're also going to have a lot of companies that will benefit from the regulatory relief they're going to get. You're going to have small companies that are going to benefit from lower tax rates um, at, at the pass-through level. So the bottom line is with this whole tax reform is, is there's, when, you, when you overhaul the tax code to make it more efficient, you're going to have winners, but you're going to have losers. And I think the market is thinking that everyone's going to be a winner in any tax reform, and that's just not the case because, you know, a lot of people have been getting all these loopholes and, and giveaways and this and that. And when you try to take that away, some will benefit and some won't. I completely agree. And it seems like the market is pricing in for perfection. A lot of stocks, you know, it's not trading on sound fundamental valuations right now. It's trading on, you know, a Trump hopium premium that he can fix the economy. And that's kind of, you know, a hope and pray investment strategy. But it seems, you know, everyone on Wall Street is so myopic that uh, you know they're just trying to make uh, you know profits for the next week or the next quarter, and they're op they're way too optimistic that tr uh, Trump can fix things so quickly given the mess he's inherited. I would say. Yeah, um, I, I I agree with that. I I, I think that um, when when you say he inherited a mess, he inherited a, a a very slow economy that has way too much leverage, and interest rates that are artificially suppressed. So. No matter what he's going to do, the question is, and how I define 2017-2018 is the battle between fiscal and regulatory reform and the hope for benefits that that brings in totality versus the headwind of the aftermath of eight extraordinary years of monetary policy and zero rates and quantitative easing, and now that that is beginning to reverse. I'm of the belief that that will eventually win out in the short term in terms of its impact on the markets and the economy. But longer term, hopefully, um, we'll be on better fiscal footing in terms of policy. Um, but there's no painful way out. There's no free lunch to the extraordinary policies of central banks uh, now that they're beginning to reverse themselves. Do you think the Federal Reserve will be able to reduce its balance sheet anytime soon? Because I know they've been talking about this for years, about eventually reducing the balance sheet, but I really don't see any way where they can where they can drastically reduce the balance sheet anytime soon without you know a stock market crash or sending the economy, the real economy, into a much worse situation. Unfortunately, I, you know, you wish, but you, I, I don't see it happening. You can't have rates at zero for eight years. You can't quintuple the size of your balance sheet and somehow unwind that. With no problem, the, the, the U.S. economy, U.S. asset prices, the world economy, global asset prices have become addicted to cheap money, and you take that away in any form, and it will have an impact. The only thing that saved the U.S. stock market when the Fed ended QE was that the Bank of Japan and the European Central Bank were full steam ahead on their QE. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the ECB is cutting back from their QE beginning April 1st. And the Bank of Japan is getting tested every day uh, on, on their yield curve control and what they're doing with their bond market. So I, I, I think that it's wishful thinking to say that Yellen's going to be able to exit smoothly and everything will be fine. We have a, the third most expensive stock market ever because of low interest rates. And you take that away and there's going to be a hangover of some sort. I don't know when it starts. I don't know how big it's going to be. I'm just not going to delude myself to thinking it's not eventually going to happen. Yeah, I agree. I think the Federal Reserve uh, and other global central bankers have delayed. There's obviously been some pain uh, throughout the economy. There's been a lot of pain on Main Street. Wall Street has gotten you know so much cheap money to buy up asset prices that they've done well uh, during uh, from 2009 forward. But uh, I don't think there's any way to delay the pain. But I, I am kind of uh, positive, cautiously optimistic, at least, that Trump does have some good ideas for helping to fix the real economy, like, you know, eliminating the amounts of regulation and making a lot better tax code. But that's going to take a couple years, at least, for him to get all these things pushed through. Agreed. It, it takes time for, uh, for us to fully realize. Let's look back when Reagan was elected in November 1980. 
the market was obviously very excited, followed four years of Carter, and followed a, a 15-year bear market in stocks. And we rallied about 10% over the next five months in you know, celebration. But reality set in. We were in the midst of a recession. Uh, interest rates were only uh, beginning to get cut. And the stock market fell 27% before we were able to enjoy the fruits of, of the changes in policy. And uh, again, that was um, unfortunately because he came in with, uh, with interest rates very high in a difficult economy. Uh, but he came in with the S&P 500 trading at eight times earnings and debt to GDP at 160% instead of 250% that we have now. Uh, m- much different circumstances. Yeah, and it, it'll be it'll be very interesting to see what happens with the stock market. I know the stock market's even more value, overvalued than when Reagan took office. So you know it could easily fall a lot more than the twenty seven percent on one hand, but was, on the it other, eight, it was eight times earnings when he was elected. Yeah, rally ten percent. That's all twenty seven percent. We're trading at on gap earnings last twelve months twenty five times earnings. Yeah, and we got utility stocks with really no revenue growth trading at 23 times earnings, Coca-Cola at 28 times earnings, you know, with really no revenue growth. So there's there, there there's definitely those are priced like growth stocks. And yet I think, you know, part of the these uh, financial repression that the central bankers have put in is when I talk to people who uh, who I ask about, uh, you know, investing. Uh, people are always looking for more income. So I think because of this manipulation of interest rates and negative interest rates and financial repression, it's caused a lot of people who've lost income to go and chase uh, higher dividend yields on stocks uh, and move those things up to way beyond rational valuations. Uh, I agree. Uh, there, there's been, that, but that's what happens when you artificially suppress interest rates. You create this grab for yield. It's the same thing we have, that we saw in the mid 2000s. It was a massive grab for yield. Um, the, 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 the saver has been the, the, the sacrificial lamb of this uh, interest rate experiment. And uh, what do you do if you can't get savings at a, in a CD? Well, you buy dividend-paying stocks, and you try to get yield any which way, which unfortunately forces you to take more risk than you are comfortable with Yeah, exactly. or used to. Yeah, exactly. And the wealth, the wealth effect, you know, uh, they said like Ben Bernanke was giving speeches when he was a uh, Federal Reserve chairman about how that would benefit Main Street. But I haven't seen any real results of how that has benefited Main Street. I've seen, you know, the wealth effect has basically created with the Federal Reserve has basically created, you know, an even larger wealth disparity in the United States. Yes, uh, there's no question that uh, that, has, that has happened. That's what happens when you get asset price inflation and only a portion of the population owns assets. Well, Peter, your wealth of information. Uh, if our listeners want to follow your work more closely, how did they do so? Uh, I would go to my newsletter website. It's www.bookreport.com, and it's spelled B-O-O-C-K, report.com, where you can check me out at bookmarkadvisors.com, B-O-O-K-M-A-R-K, advisors.com. Excellent. And I enjoyed this discussion and I like listening to your interviews on King World News and reading your article. So hopefully you'll want to come back on in a few months uh, for another update. Yes, definitely. Thanks, Jason. Mo and I are trying to raise $1,000 per month for our Patreon account. We have over 2,600 viewers per YouTube video. So if we can get most of our loyal listeners or all of our loyal listeners to donate a dollar per month or, f- or up to $5 per month, which would be amazing, That would cover most, if not all, of the money that we need. So uh, we also accept one-time donations if you go to the Wall Street for MainStreet.com website. Uh, We accept donations in cash uh, via PayPal. Fiat, you can donate there. Uh, You can donate uh, Bitcoin through our Bitcoin wallet there on the website. Or you can donate gold and silver. We have a gold money account, and we also accept mail donations of physical gold and silver. Uh, Thank you guys for listening, and uh, we appreciate any and all help. Please forward it to friends. Okay, bye.